Good morning, everyone. This is Servium calling. Welcome to the start of season three of our INET webinars, which is I need one of those. So thank you for taking the, uh, the time out to, uh, to join us today. Uh, as usual, we are using Zoom to, uh, to deliver our webinar and there will be a recording uh, later on. So we're focused today on Microsoft and uh, security features. And I'm, I'm joined by Greg Howarth, who's the Cloud Services Director from one of our strategic service partners, Hybrid Service. So morning, Greg, welcome. Morning. So today, um, Greg, we're sort of doing a bit of a security bake-off, aren't we? And um, it's all about, uh, you know, the flavor of Microsoft 365. And uh, I know there's lots of ingredients, but uh, I think we're going to pick on some of the key ones, aren't we, this morning? Because so, there's quite a lot of ingredients, isn't there? That's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hopefully everyone who's registered early, you've got your Smarties. So it's time to put your feet up and uh, relax, grab a coffee. The purpose of our webinar series really is to, is to inform you, enlighten you around technologies, disruptive technologies, things that happen in the marketplace, trends, things where we, we think that can uh, deliver a lot of value to, uh, to you and, uh, and your business. So it's 28th of uh, February. It's a leap year. So what's happened on the 28th of February? Well, in 1961, Barry McGuigan, the Irish boxer, was born in Clones in Ireland. In 1966, for Beatles fans, the Cavern Club unfortunately uh, closed in Liverpool. 1984, this is when I used to love the satirical puppet show Spitting Image, premiered on ITV. Um, 86, EEC, the, the, the European Union, signed a specific act for uh, free trade. So quite interesting where we are today. And uh, unfortunately, a year ago, Andre Previn, the, the German-born uh, American conductor, uh, uh, died and to me he's most famous for uh, his Morecambe Wise sketch but uh, he died at the age of 89. So that's events in history on the 28th of uh, February. Today it's all about iNoot and our, and our Bake Off. There will be an opportunity uh, at the end of the presentation to ask some questions uh, as well and uh, Greg is our subject matter expert today, heads up uh, a whole team of uh, solution architects, technical architects, that specialize in uh, cloud services, particularly around the, uh, around the Microsoft stack. So there's a bit, a bit of background. And uh, for people who are new today, let me just uh, talk about Servium, just set the scene a little bit before I pass over to, uh, to Greg. So the key part of our role really in these webinars and as a, a solution provider is to put the customer, you at the center of uh, everything we do, your challenge and so on. We, we become a troubleshooter. And how do we do that? Well, we have exceptional account management. We provide superb customer service. We have a, a, a great uh, services ecosystem. Uh, and we go that extra mile for you, uh, our customers. Our whole approach really is a full life cycle uh, approach uh, from strategy design, implementation, support. I think the key thing for us is when we've delivered a project, no matter how small, how large, we review it at the ends to make sure we've delivered within time scales, within budget, and more importantly, within your expectations. So our ecosystem and, and Greg and his team uh, and business form a key part of that. It really does give us a lot of breadth and depth that, uh, of resource, technical skills, expertise that uh, you have access to um, as our customers. We can scale that as well very quickly. And I think for me, one of the key things um, is its transparency. When we engage with our partners and uh, on your behalf, you know who we're using and why we're using those particular experts. And that's quite unique in the industry, I believe, because everyone partners, but our transparency, I believe, is key. So there's a lot of services that we, we can offer, and the slide there hopefully gives you a little bit of a, a, a flavor of what we, can, what we can do. But as I said before, a tremendous breadth and depth of capabilities uh, delivered through uh, our ecosystem. So if you look at the Serbian Pathfinder, where does this particular focus today? Well, it's very much around the workspace and security uh, area uh, within our Pathfinder. So a little bit of background on Serbian. I'm now gonna pass the floor over to, to Greg and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit more and uh, 
about the Microsoft and Office 365. Over to you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to uh, sit through the next sort of 25 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> so Steve's asked me to talk today um, on a subject that really is um, a subject that is a regular conversation and that is the functionality difference uh, between Office 365 and Microsoft 365, particularly from a security slant. This table kind of illustrates the breadth of the functionality at a top level with all of the feature sets with it that are available under the various licensing SKUs um, and clearly there's a lot to go over. So today we're going to focus on three different areas that I think uh, are both linked and relevant and probably the topics that come up uh, most when we're discussing the right choice between uh, Office 365 and Microsoft 365, both from an E3 and an E5 perspective. Um, it's important to note that all of these uh, product sets are available as individual SKUs, and I, I believe that was covered in the previous uh, webinar session. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much detail about the individual licensing SKUs. Um, just talk a little bit about the technology and how it can help you. Um, I realize that this screen might be a little bit blurred, um, depending on the size of your monitor, but the, I think the slides are going to be available afterwards, so you can have a little review of all, the, all, all of the sets that are available to you. So the three topics that I'm going to talk about are Active Directory Premium Plan 2 and the differences between that and Plan 1, Microsoft Defender ATP, Advanced Threat Protection, and Windows Hello for Business, and why they can work well together as a feature set and what the differences are. So starting with uh, Active Directory Premium, uh, this slide kind of illustrates the different versions of Active Directory Premium. I am going to focus in on Plan 2, but you can see there's a whole raft of features that are available either out of the box when you first sign up to Office 365 or Microsoft 365, um, and what are available on the advanced uh, licensing plans and equally why they're important. So one of the most common questions is, what is Plan 2 Active Directory Premium? Why is it more expensive and what do I get for it? As a general rule of thumb, with Plan 2 um, licensing within Microsoft, you tend to find that the majority of the functionality is around reporting and analytics as opposed to simply turning features on. And more often than not, from a security standpoint, the questions that we are asked is, how did that happen? Why did that happen? What could we have done to improve uh, and protect against threats within our environment? And this is where Active Directory Premium Plan 2 really starts to shine from that perspective. And likewise for the other feature sets that I'm going to talk about. So this is all about protecting the identity of your users and in real time, creating policies that prevent events from occurring in the first place, as well as reporting. So we can create policies within Active Directory Plan 2 that protects key accounts. Uh, we can enforce multi-factor authentication um, to specific accounts based on their access rights. We can report on suspicious logon attempts, and um, there's a couple of slides that make this a little bit more visible. Uh, we have had to anonymize it a little bit, but effectively within the dashboards, you're able to see who logged on, detect whether it's suspicious, what account was used, what operating system it was used to log on with, and indeed what application was used to log on to that service and the IP address uh, that that event occurred in. And this is really useful for things like detecting impossible travel. Um, I would say that the majority of the breaches that we come across with our clients are generally down to weak password policies and uh, locations being accessed, uh, services being accessed from locations that are not necessarily uh, within the organization's typical pattern of where their users work from. Services such as like, an account was used to log in in London and then an impossible travel event occurred and that same account was used to log into services uh, from, a, from a distance away. We want to be able to not only log that, but we want to be able to actually perhaps take some actions against that, maybe suspend the account for a period uh, while that event is investigated. Um, 
or it may be that somebody's just simply had a very lovely holiday and has been um, overzealous in their working, shall we say. We can also uh, enable privileged identity management. Now, this is a methodology for providing just-in-time access rights to administrator accounts and creating workflows and notifications off the back of that. In a traditional environment, you tend to find that you know, administrator accounts or special accounts that are issued to resource workers that are separate from their day-to-day -day logins, but more often than not have been over-provisioned with the rights that they have to work on those services. It's not uncommon to see somebody having you know, full admin rights when really they only need specific access to do their job at any one time. With privileged identity management, which is part of the plan to SKU, we can provision services at the point in time they need to do those tasks and then remove them again afterwards. Now, this clearly has benefits from the perspective that should that ever account be breached uh, for any reason at all, they're not actually going to have the permissions to get far within your environment. And importantly, we can audit and review how those resources were accessed, where they were accessed from, why they were accessed. And this really does assist with compliance and uh, regulatory uh, restrictions that you might have as an organisation. And also to answer those questions of how did this happen, which is the biggest question that we ever get asked. It's all very well detecting an event, but understanding how it happened and then being able to follow that up with a set of remediation activities is for a lot of organizations, the biggest challenge they have. So that's the fundamental difference between a plan one and a plan two. Plan one, we can switch services on. Plan two, we can actually take that one stage further and create automated reports and actions off the back of that. So just in a little bit more detail, so you can see, this is an exact screenshot from a, from a dashboard. Um, of a real environment. Um, and we can see here, the system has detected some logins, they've protected it, there's a status of a failure, an attempt was made to log in from Outlook uh, on a Windows 8 platform. In this particular scenario, we know there are no Windows 8 operating systems in that environment, and the system has detected that, blocked it, and flagged it as a risk. Uh, all these things are customizable, and we can set a, a variety of triggers and alerts to come off the back of that, either reporting directly into your ITSM tool, or sending text messages, there's a variety of options available, um, depending on how you classify the severity of that uh, within your organization. And that might indeed be based on the access rights that those users have. <clears throat> so on this slide, we can see that there's uh, a detection type of unfamiliar sign-in properties. And this is where the AI in the background is saying, well, actually, this user doesn't usually behave like this. They don't usually log in from this location or from this application or this service. I want to notify you about that so that you can do something about it. So it's not actually blocked it. It's just kind of saying this is unfamiliar, um, not sure what you want to do, um, but something is different from normal behavior from those login attempts. And it's flagged it as a risk within the dashboard. So following on from that, and we're taking all the principles that we've just talked about from an identity perspective, we can back that up with Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. So a little bit of background on Advanced Threat Protection. That is a catch-all category for a bunch of services within the uh, Microsoft Cloud estate. We have Office 365 ATP, we have Windows Azure ATP, and we have Microsoft Defender ATP, formerly Windows Defender. This builds upon the built-in antivirus that is within your desktop operating system and is available both on the um, Microsoft 365 E5 SKUs and also individually as a Windows 10 Enterprise E5. And it is worth noting that there is a Windows 10 Enterprise E3 and an E5, and this is the only difference between those two uh, versions of Windows, is that you have the Defender built in on all platforms, but the ATP functionality comes along with the enhanced SKUs. This brings all of the services that you get from your typical desktop antivirus back into a central dashboard, which is reported within the 365 Security Center. And it allows us to follow the same principles I just talked about with the identity, but for threats and actual real-time um, 
malware and, and viruses that might be within your environment. So the screenshots here show uh, again from uh, a similar environment show us that um, an incident graph and in this case a particular desktop got a piece of malware that was detected the system blocked it and it, it didn't spread any further but what we can see from those incident graphs is where there have been multiple devices that have uh, been infected that would show up on the incident graph and you'd be able to track the spread of that across the across your estate and likewise we can alert that into a dashboard we can follow up on actions uh, and and automate responses um, on how to deal with that. And I think this all goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about it's all very well and good detecting that you've got a breach, but understanding how and where it came from and what the root cause uh, and almost patient zero of those breaches uh, is really useful in mitigating those threats and understanding maybe it was because that device wasn't patched maybe we need to uh, deliver some user training that's focused on not clicking on particular links uh, you know technology is great but it has to be supplemented by um, good strong user education on how to behave and interact with uh, web services and it also gives us a central uh, place to configure all of that much like you'd find in any other an enterprise level uh, antivirus and anti-threat product. This is all backed up by um, an AI platform that looks at, again, not just known but unknown threats, suspicious behaviors, and all of the good stuff that you would uh, expect from an enterprise level uh, product. Just in a little bit more detail, on the left-hand side, we can, we can pull up the list of machines, we can pull up a list of incidents, we can automate the response that you would get from that. Um, we have options around um, creating advanced policies for threats that might be specific to your organization. Um, quite often we do find false positives within these types of products. This isn't unique to a Microsoft platform and here we can customize um, how the antivirus interacts with applications and services that you, you might be running in your environment. So that leads me nicely on to Windows Hello as our final kind of topic and why these three things work together. So Windows Hello for business is fundamentally different to Windows Hello that you might consume on your home device. And this is a topic that gets discussed at length, typically, uh, when rolling out Windows 10 and identity management to your estate. The reason why I personally think this is probably one of the most critical things to deploy um, is because it's not just around the great user experience of facial recognition but importantly uh, pin numbers as a bare minimum and the reason for that is highlighted by the bullet points but complex passwords are hard to remember users typically do just add a date to the end of an already known password and passwords importantly are transmitted over your network when users log in the key difference with a pin number is that is stored on the tpm module the trusted platform module of your device and is never transmitted so in the event that there's been some shoulder surfing or a password becomes known amongst um people that it's not intended to be known, typically no more than the user themselves. Um, that account cannot log in if you've, if you've specified um, a PIN service and based on a set of conditional access policies. So a typical scenario might be that you only allow users to log in to your Office 365 environment from a device that is join to your domain that or or your 365 estate um, or has a certificate on or is accessing from a specific location uh, and if, it, if a user tries to log in from a device or an environment that is not part of a, a, a your managed solution such as a web cafe then automatically introduce additional layers of security to allow that account 
to access those services or indeed reduce the number of services they can access. So for example, um, you may say that if you are logging in from a, a service using conditional access, um, I'm only going to allow Outlook web access and I'm not going to allow users to log in with Outlook. When you couple that with a pin, it means that any time that those uh, passwords are breached and somebody's looking over the shoulder. If somebody does find that pin or that in some way is shared, that pin cannot be used to log into the platform at all other than on the device that that pin was set. Pins don't have to be numbers. They can be passwords, type, complexity with uh, uh, should you desire, but typically we find that a simple pin number of around six digits is enough to give a suitable level of protection without introducing point one of having very complex uh, pin numbers. That tends to reduce the threat to that individual device. It stops the password sharing um, sort of culture that we, we often see. And you can then take to increasing the duration that users have to reset their passwords. They're not used as often. You can you know, have a better user experience by having even more complex password policies because they're not used on a day-to-day -day basis. They can have slightly longer uh, expiration dates and users still get a great experience when they're logging into their device with a PIN number. And the important thing is that this also supports the other technologies that we've just talked about in terms of understanding where threats are coming from. And this might be that, you know, if you were to roll out Active Directory premium plan too and you find that you do have these types of threats detected and suspicious logins occurring and that one of the remediation steps might be well, we want to move to uh, Windows Hello for Business because that is going to reduce those num the numbers of those events that occur within your estate. Uh, for me personally in my experience Hello for Business is one of the single best features um, available and it is available as part of both the E3 and the E5 SKU within the Microsoft 365 stack. It is part of uh, the Windows management suite uh, in tune and uh, all of that other good functionality um, that you would use to deliver those services. And I, I think typically organizations that rely simply on passwords have a far greater exposure. And um, we've seen some really great successes from switching people to Windows Hello for business, um, both from that user experience and from a security standpoint. So they were the three big topics that I wanted to talk about today because within the Microsoft 365 stack, there are hundreds of security products and we could be here for a significant amount of time. Um, and I'd be more than happy um, to take the, any questions at this time. That's great, Thank, thanks for that, Greg. I think, you know, what we've sort of looked at there is, you know, there's a lot within the Microsoft 365 stack that doesn't exist within Office 365 from a security perspective. Uh, and there, you know, all those features, like you say, we, we could talk for, for a long, long time uh, about that. But I think it's good to see that the, the Microsoft 365 is more security focused. Um, we're starting to certainly see more adoption of Microsoft 365 with our customers, I presume, you know, you, you must be seeing the same as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the trend seems to be to move to um, Microsoft 365 because of the additional licensing features and in terms of managing the desktop estate, but often overlooked is the security elements. Um, you know, typically the comparisons come, well, I get, I get voice in an E5, I get uh, Power BI Pro in an E5, but you also get, all this great security stuff, which, which actually, from a commercial perspective, can simply be bolted onto E3 without that full step up. So, absolutely, um, a topic of the of the year for us. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that, Greg. Like I said, I know we're only scratching the surface. There. There, there's a lot, uh, you know, there's a lot to cover, and, and and for us, it's really, you know, it's it's focusing on what we believe in our experience and certainly your experience of the, the sort of key areas that. that are, that form a key part of, um, of the Microsoft 365 stack. So we're going to take some questions now and put, put Greg on the spot, which I always <laughs> like to do. Uh, so um, there's a QA and a box. If you want to click on that, um, then um, you'll be able to ask those questions anonymously. 
um, or, uh, so to, to save any blushes. So, Greg, I'll sort of kick off. Uh, first question from, from William. Uh, what sort of businesses would benefit from Microsoft 365? Is it suitable for smaller users or, you know, what, what's, what's your typical, uh, would you say, uh, a profile of a, a person who's adopting Microsoft 365? So Microsoft 365 has sort of three big flavors. For the smaller customers, um, 365 for business does tend to work quite well, but you do lose all of the great sort of functionality I talked about from a security standpoint, but it does introduce the ability to at least deliver patch management and um, device enrollment and applications to the desktop. Um, typically, we have seen a trend of those smaller organizations adopting the enterprise plans um, in one way, shape or form, purely because of the security uh, options that are available that simply don't don't appear in some of those uh, um, so shall we say SME SKUs. Uh, so th this is really for for everybody that has a concern over their environment. Yeah, and I think the fact that there's so many features bundled in that you might be buying other third party solutions, it it seems to make sense to put it all under uh, under one umbrella. Doesn't yeah, it? that's a really good point, Steve. You know, we see organisations spending lots of uh, money on third-party products such as antivirus or multi-factor authentication solutions um, or third-party identity management platforms and i could list them all but really this is about choosing you know products that are best in suite that represent the best value for money to all of uh, uh, to the organization versus picking point solutions you're paying for the subscription, so you may as well take advantage of it. Absolutely. Now. Yeah, okay. A question from Jeff. Um, what about upgrading from Office 365 to Microsoft 365? Um, is that relatively straightforward, Greg? <laughs> Depending on um, your agreement, it is relatively straightforward. Um, in, it's, it's a simple case of switching the uh, license within the portal to the new one uh, notwithstanding there needs to be a little bit of investigation of what about what any commit has already been made in terms of those spends typically if you're on a csp program that can be made on the fly you add the new license take the old one away and you're paying on a month by month consumption so really simple to add the licenses uh, clearly there's a little bit of work to be done in configuring those services to make it work for your organization okay good Thanks, Greg. Uh, question from Kate in, in relation to um, Microsoft 365 licenses. Do, does every user need to have a Microsoft 365 license? I, I know certainly in, in, in our experience that customers can typically mix and match, but what's your view on that, uh, Greg? And in, would every user have to have a Microsoft 365 license? Uh, another good question. So yes, you can absolutely mix and match. However, um, some licenses, should be applied to all users you know if you think about the office 365 advanced threat protection um, there's little point in not licensing all users for protecting their email against antivirus so you have to kind of look at the services as, as a whole as what those users are co um, consuming um, again what we tend to find is the choice the clear choice is between um Office 365 and M365 for desktop users. You might choose um, slightly different services if you have kiosk workers that perhaps only access on mobile, then a full-blown M365 is, is not the right answer to those. And you would probably get better value from taking um, lower Office 365 plans, but then bolting on some of the security bundles to get back to the status that we just talked about in terms of protecting their identity. Okay, that's great. Um, question from uh, Brian in, in relation to AD. Um, so if I move to Microsoft 365, can I still remain, retain Active Directory on-premise or does that have to move to Azure? Cool. Um, <laughs> I'll try to keep this answer as quick as I can because <laughs> it's a really big topic, but a yeah. great question. Um, so the, the, the short answer is you can just move to Active Directory, uh, Azure Active Directory, which is, is all underpinned by, 
um, there's three different ways to deliver directory services uh, within within the estate. So there's traditional on-premises Active Directory, there's Azure Active Directory that we just talked about, and then there's really wonderfully named Azure Active Directory Services. I think the answer to the question is, there's multiple ways to deliver this. We are seeing a trend for people to want to trim down their more traditional infrastructure as a service estates, slim down their need to deliver lots and lots of domain controllers in their estates and subject to what applications uh, are dependent on that will, will drive whether or not you can truly get to an entirely cloud managed uh, environment. And that's gonna vary from organization to organization, but there's a lot of options out there for that. Yeah, it's, it, it, is a, it is a mindful, isn't it? And, you know, and we do our best in partnership with this to try and help customers sort of wade through that, that minefield. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sa safely, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, that, well that, that's, the, that's the questions uh, for, for that today, uh, Greg. So thanks, thanks very much for, for letting me put you on the spot. Um, no problem. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Hopefully yeah, so, somebody got something useful out of that. Yeah. So what we're going to do now, for, so we're going to launch a poll and um, just uh, really get some feedback from everyone, which is, which is really important. So I'll launch that poll now. And... Part of the sort of our, our next steps on, on this, because like I say, we're only scratching the surface on this bake off because there's so many ingredients, as I said before. But um, for anyone who's interested, we, the next step would be with, with Greg and uh, some of his technical architects to, to, to do a more deep dive one to one uh, uh, call, really, to, to explore some of the other features if we've not had, you know, we've not been able to cover those off today. Let's say that we had to pick on. What in Greg's experience, uh, what what the, the, were the most sort of uh, sort of popular ones and most discussed ones in in the market? But there is a lot more. So part of the the, uh, the call, actually, if you are interested in uh, a call with a technical specialist um, from uh, from Greg's team, uh, then we're happy to uh, to arrange that. If you'd just like to um, uh, indicate that on the poll at the end, you know, we do take the poll seriously from the point of view of trying to tweak our webinars. Um, you know, we've, this is now the 25th we've delivered uh, in, in the last sort of 18 months. So feedback from you as our customers is, is really important. The sort of flavor and the, the, the sort of topics for uh, season three of iNoot was based on the customer satisfaction survey that we did towards the end of last year. So um, we, we you know, always open to uh, suggestions and feedback and so on to help us improve these as, uh, as we move forward. Um, so. The poll's launched there. If you, if you wouldn't mind completing that, I'd really appreciate uh, that. If you do have any further questions, then uh, please drop an email to inut at servium.com. If we're not being able to answer them today, then um, either myself, Greg, or the account manager will, will get back to you. Like I say, if you want to do a one-to-one -one session, then we're happy to, uh, to arrange that for you. So Greg, thanks for taking the time. Uh, it's a, it's a, a massive, subjects isn't it when you look at office 365 microsoft 365 historically we have focused more on office 365 but again the, the trend is moving towards microsoft 365 because of the security features so thanks for taking the time greg um for everyone else um again thank you uh the next island webinar is on friday the 13th of march 10 o'clock um our theme there is again something that, that's uh, quite topical and feedback from our customers. It's all around backup, hyperconverged backup, how to save money, uh, protect uh, your data, reduce RTO. How can we do faster backups, faster recoveries, more cost effectively? Um, so we're doing that in partnership with Exagrid on the uh, Friday the 13th, the superstitious uh, among us. Um, I won't be doing that. One of my colleagues will be delivering that uh, on my behalf, uh, and I'm not superstitious. Um, so the next one, you'll get details shortly. Um, there is a recording of today's webinar. We'll issue that later today. And it will also be uh, published on our YouTube channel. Um, so I do encourage you to uh, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for Servium uh, Limited. Uh, there's a lot of content there, but all the iNotes, current and future will be, uh, will be published there. So thanks everyone for taking the time. Greg, again, Thank you for, uh, for joining me today. And uh, hopefully everyone found that beneficial and enjoy the rest of your Friday, everyone. Thank you.